um, to introduce our um, speaker this evening. Rebecca is the founder of Family to Family Support Network, which trains healthcare professionals in professionals in unique family care. As an adoptive parent of three, all of whom are now young adults, Rebecca had vastly different hospital experiences that put her on the path to this career where she seeks to transform healthcare culture. And I think she's doing a great job with that. Um, I will put the link to families to Family Support Network in the chat and hand it over to Rebecca. Thank you, Betsy. Well, when Betsy uh, called and asked if I wanted to do this, I had to think about it for like this long because I think it's so important that we have this conversation about healthcare and about how things have been changing in healthcare and infant adoption itself and the importance of addressing healthcare professionals. So as was mentioned, I'm an adoptive parent. I have gone through three adoptions. We had two hospital experiences within those and they were just vastly different. These were both over 20 years ago. Uh, one of them was very positive for us as a family. Um, it was the phone call where you've just finished your home study and all of a sudden you've been chosen and she's at the hospital and you're going to be a mom and it's a girl. And it was very, very quick. Um, but we had a pretty positive experience there coming out in fertility. They really uh, saw us as parents, really treated us as parents. And that was really important. Um, then our second child came home a little older, but our third child, we met his mom when she was just seven weeks pregnant and we did the whole pregnancy together and I was her childbirth coach, et cetera. And then we got to the hospital and it was incredibly awkward. It was very, um, different, just nurse to nurse, doctor to doctor. Um, it all kind of depended Really, it felt like how they felt about our situation. Um, this 19-year-old that had chosen my husband and I to be parents to this little boy. And it was really my first time where I thought, what kind of education is there? Because I just saw the nurses struggling as they struggled to know how to handle us. I, I will fully confess I was a nightmare potential adoptive mom, um, which is not pretty if you've ever seen one. Um, but just knowing wanting so much for them to honor. Uh, my son's mom, and that this would be a time that we had really thought a lot about. Um, and so when I started asking, you know, what's the education like? Here's this concept of openness in the hospital. And we know that we've introduced this perspective adoptive family to be in the hospital. And when you think about like the old model of adoption, you you don't think of the overlaps of the family that we get now. And in the old model, it's kind of like baby was whisked away, mom was told to forget it ever happened, family's sitting at a social work office somewhere to pick up baby, and there's never this overlap. And we call it the wedding and the funeral in the same room at family to family, and just realizing that the dynamics within the hospital are so emotionally charged and complex. And, and when I found out there was no education around that, and that my nurses that I talked with would say, no, no one's telling us what to do. We don't know how to navigate this. Um, it felt so unfair because the more I dug into it, the more I talked to the adoption community and heard people say, well, yeah, the nurse did this or the doctor did this. And I'm like, you know, they have no training, right? Like, No one's talking about this. No one's really looking at this, at that healthcare moment, which is the 11th hour. And so um, that was in 2003. In 2004, Parker Adventist Hospital opened just south of Denver. I had already started teaching some waiting classes for um, families at Littleton Adventist here in Denver, just south of Denver. And they asked if I'd bring my classes. And I said, what I really want to do, though, is be there for like the patients and for the families and the nurses and kind of be that point person. And um, as a new hospital, they said, yeah, let's let's go ahead and try it. You can come in contract. We'll just have you be what I joke as the wedding coordinator for adoptions. And I did that um, over 10 years at that hospital. And we just, we did a lot of amazing adoptions, a lot of super hard adoptions. But the biggest thing we did is we sat with everyone and said, tell me what that was like for you. What could have made it better? What would you take out? What would you add? And the more we leaned into the hospital experience, the more we really saw that it was just, it was a bereavement situation. It was you know, the concept of the programming around an infant loss 
that has changed in the last 30 years. 30 years ago, if you lost a child uh, at delivery, the parents were put at the end of the hall, the baby's body was whisked away. There was no discussion about it. And now we've learned we can do loss well. And so now if there's an infant loss at the hospital, we do footprints and we let them, the parents hold the body and, and take pictures and all these things to help us do loss well. And I couldn't understand the more that I got to know the moms considering or choosing adoption, why we weren't giving them the same treatment as they crafted their time in the hospital. And so we really did end up with a program that acknowledged the loss for that mom, whether or not she wanted the family there or not. That was another big piece was the realization that there was really no conversation that was happening with the patient that included if she even wanted the adoptive family there and the potential adoptive family there. And just realizing the importance of, of empowering her voice and choice during the time in the hospital. And so we spent, like I said, 10 years crafting this program. At that point, it was a family to family adoption support program. And we modeled it as a bereavement program. We um, started utilizing a book called um, Forever Fingerprints, which is actually written by Sherry Eldridge, if any of you have seen that book, but it is a children's book, and it's this little girl making sense of her adoption story, and in the book, she finds out her aunt's pregnant, and her parents explain to her she was never closer to her mom than when her fingerprints were created, and so as she's learning who this birth mom is, she feels she carries her on her fingertips. And in the book, she kisses her fingertips when she misses her mom. And so we got that book from Sherry and were able to utilize that with the families. We made sure that the moms did fingerprints and footprints in the front covers, that they were able to take a book home. They had the opportunity to write messages to their child and put, again, fingerprints, footprints. It was if you've ever tried to do fingerprints with a baby, it's not easy. Um, but it was this, it was really, it gave, it was two things. It, it acknowledged what was happening in that space, but it also sent a picture book home with families that I don't think we were really given a lot of tools to acknowledge openness. I think um, those of us that have kids in our 20s, we were just kind of told like, do openness ready, go. And we were like, wait, wait, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> How do we do that? And so it was an, it was a way that we could send the story home with that potential adoptive family to say, you, you have a story to tell and she's going home with you and she's, your child's going to see that connection on her fingertips and just hoping they would use that, that connection with that mom, with that family. And over time, we just found, it also gave us the opportunity to meet with parents earlier in their pregnancy so that if they weren't gonna carry to term, that they were referred to Parker Adventist Hospital to explore their parenting resources, to explore ethical adoption resources, to just be like a neutral party, to be in a neutral space where there were pros and cons that could be just hashed out without there being money to be made. <laughs> Skin in the game, shall we say. So the idea of us being in healthcare in this space just introduced a whole um, new empowering, I don't know if space is the right word, but place for families to explore what they could do should they carry the term and should they be looking at parenting resources and adoption resources. And my role was adoption liaison. And so um, we had referrals from all over the state of Colorado we had people coming from churches, from Planned Parenthood, from schools, from family members, from just, you're going to carry the term now, let's get your prenatal care started, and let's start exploring what your options are. And that gap was just, um, it was super important. It was also, you can imagine, it's a really, it's a volatile space, because you have the pro-life and pro-choice that are kind of the push and pull, and so many times during that 10 years at Parker Adventist, I had people ask, well, but but what are you guys really? And I'm like, oh, we're a pro-education program. We you know, make sure that people are empowered to have the information they need. And they're like, yeah, but what are you really? And I'm like, oh my gosh, we're pro-education. So that was really challenging. And it continues to be challenging to try to introduce empowered decision-making, shared decision-making, informed consent within healthcare around the concept of adoption because we tend to just assume 
that everything's black and white, that it's very this side or that side. And that's just not what we saw with our nurses. So as we started crafting our education, we started really diving into what do healthcare professionals carry with them? Uh, we call it your suitcase. I did have a nurse recently at a conference go, oh my gosh, you're the suitcase lady. And like, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, but really that idea that we all carry thoughts, feelings, emotions, experiences with us, and that affects the way that we care for our patients. And we could have a nurse that comes in and pressures a patient to parent, and we can have a nurse that comes in and pressures a patient to place. And when you start to address something like I have in healthcare, you start hearing stories from all over the country. And so if you're thinking, well, I don't think that really happens, I, I can tell you stories on both sides, multiple stories on both sides. And, you know, even doctors coming in and saying, I'm not going to discharge you till you do the right thing. And it's like, wait, what's in your suitcase that's this patient's right thing? That idea of coming in and pressuring someone, not knowing their story, not knowing their situation, just came really important for us to put some guardrails around our healthcare professionals. And so we went ahead and actually started introducing the concept of the ones and tens. If you follow my work at all, you've heard me say this a lot, but just the idea that the ones are really anti and the tens are really pro. And if you think of that continuum, the very end, ends are loud. And sometimes just like an overwhelming. And a lot of times we don't want to be affiliated with the people that are on the ends because they tend to have a really extreme view. And I think they've done a really good job in silencing the two through nines of us. <laughs> I think if I'm a, a four on any given issue, I may not want to say anything because you might think I'm a one and ones can be over the top crazy. And maybe I'm not a one, but I am a four. I see the gray. I see the nuances. And so we really encourage all of our healthcare professionals to be a five. We call it strive to be a five. And it means that you are respectful, you're neutral, you're compassionate, and you see your patient and you're their person. What do I need to do for you? What is it that you need? And that became super important because if you think of, you could put anything on the ones and tens, right? You could do Democrat, Republican, pro-life, pro-choice, breastfeeding, formula feeding. Um, but you also have that anti-adoption, pro-adoption. And to be able to stand in a space and be neutral with a patient, because there were certainly times people would say, well, what, what do you think I should do? And we would have to say, you know what? I know you're going to make the right decision. How can, how can I help you? What do you need? And that may be the only person that's approaching her in a neutral space. And I've had people that would love to see adoptions go up go up, the numbers go up and say, Rebecca, you need to talk more about the beautiful and the and all the great things. And I'm like, mm, no, I don't. And well, you need to talk about all this other stuff. And I'm like, no, no, I don't. Like our goal for consistent care of our patients is to be that five. And it's essential right now. I don't think we've ever had a time in society where we are more apt to share our opinions and assume everyone else should agree with us. Uh, we call the ones and tens your bumper stickers and your yard signs. And I often tell my nurses, like, they should not know your bumper stickers or your yard signs. And so that's just super important for us to know as healthcare professionals to stay in that neutral space, to not be pressuring patients one way or the other based on what's in my suitcase. And so over time, we actually, you'll hear us talk about the Unique Families Program and I could do a whole other talk about how that all came to, to be, but I will say that we expanded how we care for families, the neutral compassionate care uh, to other populations. So we found that a lot of the support that we did for adoption and potential adoptive families and moms overlapped into intended parents and surrogacy. Uh, we call it dual family care. So we train healthcare professionals on, I have an assignment I have the person who's giving birth, but then I have the person who potentially is going to be the caregiver. So I have two people that are on site. We see that with substance use disorder, and maybe there's a guardian or a foster parent that's come in. Uh, we see it with incarcerated patients. So maybe there's, again, a guardian that's going to come in. So we're always focusing in on how can we offer best, best care and best outcomes for the child and for the birthing person, whether that's, again, a surrogate, um, mom considering adoption, an incarcerated patient, like all of those folks deserve respectful, neutral, compassionate care. And that unique family umbrella 
just became super important for us to apply to all of our patients. All families have unique needs. We know we've expanded. We have the LGBTQIA population and knowing that they may have unique needs as well. And so how do we make sure the mom dad triad that's actually what a lot of our policies are about and written in for hospitals. Um, how do we make it the policy actually reflect the actual patient populations? <laughs> because mom, dad, baby is kind of more unique sometimes than the families that we see now. And so the program actually expanded. We don't just, we teach through the concept of adoption and, and empowered parenting, but we also touch on all these other patient populations. We also have added maternal mortality and morbidity implicit bias, making sure we're empowering our uh, healthcare professionals to be trauma aware, knowing that the, oh my gosh, the percentage of our patients that have gone through trauma, we have to consider that when we're going to treat them with respect, neutral, compassionate care. And so it's really become a, a comprehensive, unique family program. Now, during this whole process, um, I definitely saw the Supreme Court um, decision coming. I think those of us that have worked in this space had a feeling this was heading this way. And I remember I wrote an article a couple of years ago about the idea, the concept of the article was that there is a toll road just south of Denver that was going in. And while they're building this whole toll road, they weren't addressing the side streets that people would have to go on should they not be able to go on the toll road. And they just weren't looking at the alternative routes. And I've seen that with abortion, adoption, and parenting, that we have restrictions that are happening in abortion now, but now we have to address the alternative routes. And we're just finishing up a series called Coming Together for Families. I'll actually um, see if I can put that in the chat for you. And it's, it's coming together with leaders across the country not to talk about how we feel about the Dobbs decision, but instead to say, now what do we do? <laughs> like, what do we do? How do we handle this to make sure we're empowering hospitals? Now, as far as hospitals are concerned, those of us, again, in this space are highly concerned with the just the lack of consistency in healthcare across the board. We know that the staffing is, we're short-staffed in the hospitals. We know that there's exhaustion, obviously, post-pandemic. And we also know that with short staff means we don't have necessarily the specialists that are in the OB departments that maybe we had in the past. And so the concern being, if there's not standardized care in the hospitals, how can we make sure we're protecting patients, that they have voice and choice? How do we make sure that they're aware of parenting resources in any community? How do we make sure that they're not on Google and just... Googling to find a, a professional that's going to help them with adoption. And that's, again, really concerning. I also often equate what's happening in the hospital with the concept of lack of oversight concerning like organ donation, which sounds weird, but stay with me because we know there's a whole organ donation donor alliance.gov that oversees the transfer of organs in healthcare, but we don't have consistent oversight and policy and best practice when you're talking about infant adoption. So we have a kidney and we have a baby and we are more focused and causing um, more, put more protections on, again, the kidney than this transfer of a child from one family to another. So Super concerning. We know that during this time, we with the internet and the growth of the internet, we have no standardized referral system. If you look at the ACOG ethics guidelines, which is basically the um, guide, ethics guidelines for OBGYNs across the country, that you can read this statement for ethics. But as you're reading it, you think, and how are they supposed to do this? Like it talks about how they're supposed to re be referring to ethical adoption resources. They're not supposed to be calling a, a, another patient they have that's gone, going through infertility and being like, hey, I have a 17-year-old that's having a baby, or hey, I have a 35-year-old that's having a baby, and I told her about you, and why don't you guys get together? Like, that cannot happen, but I hear stories about it all the time. I just heard another story last week about the uh, matching happening within healthcare, and I think we look at that and say, well, it's not ethical, but is it illegal? And I'm like, you wouldn't cut in line as a nurse or a doctor with a kidney donation. <laughs> you go to the process and you make sure that people are educated. If you have a situation where a person's at end of life 
and there's a potential for organ donation, the nurses aren't even allowed to talk to them about that. They call in the specialist, the neutral person to come in and talk about the organ donation process. So there's no coercion. And I think how can we implement what we know to be best practice in heaven forbid transfers of kidneys when we're looking at children within healthcare. And so highly concerning when you think of the lack of oversight. The other piece that's changed that I kind of see this as a perfect storm in this space um, after 20 years and after the introduction of the internet and now with the Dobb decision that we also have a lot of nurse travelers out there. And so we will hear people say, well, you know, the nurse was there. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to talk to the nurse. Um, I was actually just watching a, a thing that was like, what do I do when I'm at the hospital? Like, oh, ask the nurse. The nurse will help you coordinate your adoption. And I'm like, ah, the nurse is not trained in coordinating an adoption. <laughs> You're asking her to go to her suitcase, right? So super concerning. And on top of that, with travelers, we're talking about nurses that go and do a three-month stint in a different state most often, and they get one orientation shift. And during that one orientation shift, they are not learning adoption law and oversight and procedure for that state. I'm guaranteeing that. So now we have 30% of our nurses that aren't necessarily from that area. We know now when we train, we're going to have state maps that say, well, these are the state maps for adoption laws. Here's the state match for safe haven laws. Here's the state map for um, a, a abortion restrictions. Here's the state map for surrogacy. Like we're going to have so many state to state decisions and without oversight, how do we protect these families? How do we protect these babies? And so um, you can imagine that's concerning. On top of that, when you bring that up, the response is often, well, we have case managers that do that. Well, I honestly can tell you, I have yet to say those words at a nursing training and not have the, the laughter come from the audience because not because the case managers don't want to help, but they're often not 24 seven. You can have a mom come in on Friday and say she's doing adoption and she got connected with the family on the internet. And they're like, well, the case manager is not back till Monday what's going to happen in that space? Oh, and by the way, the family's flying in from another state to come pick up this baby. So they may have someone on call for that situation on a weekend, but it could be the ICU case manager that's coming in and they're like, I, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. So the idea that there's not care and concern and oversight um, is really disconcerting. Um, I know that we've had a lot of conversations about Safe Haven. We actually have three webinars on our site that we did shortly after the Dobbs decision came out. And that really came from the incredible concern we have that that cannot be our go-to in response to women in crisis. That I honestly believe every baby, quote unquote, saved in a, in a baby box through Safe Haven, it stands for a mother that's been failed. She didn't have information. She didn't have anything to anyone to talk with. We don't know that she's okay. And I sincerely see it as a lose, lose, lose when you talk about all that's lost during a safe haven or a drop box. So when you think of that idea, I don't know if it's been shared in here before, but the idea is say for Indiana, where they've allocated a million dollars to put drop boxes in and what we need to do is put that money towards conversations and how do we encourage conversation and not abandonment? How do we make sure that there can be a conversation that says, you know, what's going on? How can we help you? Are you okay? You know, being able to connect with that mom and make sure that she's physically okay, emotionally okay, that if there are any needs that she has, and we know that child, they lose everything if there's an anonymous drop off. And that adoptive family, that potential adoptive family loses everything. And I think the more that we build up the idea that safe haven and, and baby drop boxes are the answer, uh, we're going to have to combat that because the more you build them, the more they get advertised, the more they get advertised, the more they get used, the more babies that are saved. And now we build more and we can't build more. <laughs> it's like those are supposed to be for women that are in postpartum psychosis, they're heading to the dumpster. We want to save the babies from that. We do not want safe haven and drop boxes to be the go-to. We have to be empowered 
at the healthcare space to have conversations and ensure that families are supported. I'm getting all worked up. And my last thing that I would just want to point out and highlight is if we can build in programming and education for healthcare professionals, if we can come in, and I don't expect nurses to um, counsel moms that come in and say, I'm doing adoption. I don't expect them to do full board you know, uh, choice counseling in that moment, but I do expect they need to have somebody that they, they can call that's neutral and aware, whether it's a nurse navigator that focuses on unique families, whether it's a patient advocate that focuses specifically on parenting and adoption. Because if we don't have that, the only place that most hospitals go is to red flag a family for child protective services. So when I talk to hospitals and I say, you know, if she comes in and has an adoption plan because this family's flying in from Florida and there's nobody here but a folder and she changes her mom mind and wants to parent, what do you do? They say, well, we refer them to child protective services. We've now opened a file on her because we don't have the infrastructure upstream to empower her to parent without opening a file with her with social services. And I know there are some places that are building in those infrastructures, but it's not consistent. And I think with so much that's happening with healthcare and within this space of pro-life, pro-choice, abortion, adoption, parenting, a clear path to empowered decision-making is key for informed consent when we're talking about those that are going through crisis. And so that really is the vision that we have. We continue to fight on Capitol Hill. I actually posted a picture on my Facebook uh, this last week of myself and my family and Capitol Hill 11 years ago when we found out that we had the only hospital-based adoption program in the nation. And I just couldn't sit on this model that empowers families upstream and so ended up ultimately quitting my job as the adoption liaison and starting our nonprofit family to family support network to really build in this structure around hospitals to empower healthcare professionals to know how to talk to moms, how to, if potential adoptive families are there, to have those conversations, to help there be a crafting of a story for that baby, something that marks that time of what's happening in the hospital. Because we just, we know that when words are spoken, especially in a time of grief, they just etch into your heart. We see that when women go through loss and miscarriages and you'll say, did someone say something that didn't help? They're like, oh my gosh, this is what they said to me. And they can usually tell you word for word. Most people have nurse stories about their adoptions that are very much like that. Tell me about a story with a nurse or a doctor that was great or was a struggle for you. And when they tell me those stories, they can tell me word for word what that nurse or what that doctor said to them and what power there is in that 24 to 72 hours within that hospital to really make sure people are leaving fully within their voice, that they're empowered, and then that child will have the best outcomes possible. So that's our dream. So let's just all do that. We'll just put this in every hospital. <laughs> we do have two pieces of legislation that we're working on right now. Um, one focuses on taking out unregulated adoption professionals, trying to regulate adoption and making sure that we're not having baby to the highest bidder. We also want to make sure that we put in training in healthcare. That's the second bill. The sad thing is we do know that there's a ton of corruption going on in hospitals across the country. We know that there's bullying that's happening where an attorney or an agency comes in and tells the staff how this is going to go. And that's by no means empowering to anybody. So we worry what might be going on when there's not the oversight. So you guys can help us raise the awareness. Um, when Betsy said this was going to be recorded, I was like, oh, I hope they send it to their friend who's a nurse or to doctors or to hospital CEOs. Because I think if they knew what is happening in hospitals around this, the danger of trafficking, the danger of liability, um, for their staff, we have to address it because we just, we don't know what the next five years is going to hold, but a whole lot of what it's going to hold is going to happen in that hospital and in the walls of that hospital. So important to have education at the base. Oh, I hope you have questions for me. I know that is a lot to go through. Betsy, did I miss anything that you and I have talked about? Um, no, I have a couple questions, and if other people oh. have questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, 
Rebecca, um, near the end of your comments, you mentioned the word trafficking, and um, you know, I know there's um, some correlations and some discussion around, um, you know, the relationship there. So, um, could no. would you like to talk about that just a little bit? More? No, I'm really, I'm really glad you said that because we are absolutely looking at this and saying what are the dangers of trafficking, and we don't have oversight within those hospital walls. Um, we know there's kind of the I don't want to say caricature, but like the typical picture you have of human trafficking. But then when you put it under the guise of infant adoption, and I've had people out there say, oh, don't ever say, you know, trafficking with adoption because we don't want that to be what we're doing. I'm like, okay, but if there's all this money changing hands and it's not being done illegally and the child's crossing state lines with a family that's not legally, <laughs> like, um, I think we have to take a closer look at that. So I was even doing some research today. We've we've talked to American Hospital Association about doing um, education for what hospitals need to be looking at and looking for. Um, but when you look at human trafficking, they have the U.S. definition says it includes um, force, fraud, coercion, deception, or abuse of power to compel a person to perform a labor or service. And I think if we are really willing to stop and look at some of what is happening out there with women that are choosing adoption, whether they're getting into an adoption plan pregnant and all this money is coming into them, their bills are being paid, the baby gets is born, and then they want a parent and they're being told, well, you can't now, or, or if you do, you're going to have to pay all that money back, you know, and being bullied to place, I have to wonder if we need to take a closer look at that to make sure that we're not setting setting up a scenario that trafficking can go unaddressed. Um, and like I said, without oversight in the hospitals, I don't know how you can crack down on this. And I don't know if the question is going to come up or who pays for your program, because that's the dollar question. Um, who pays for our program? That's the hard part, because we have hospitals that need need structured education for their staff around adoption. But, you know, where where does that fall? Is that something that the state should be doing? Should there be federal dollars? What needs to happen to build that infrastructure? Um, the unique families piece has really helped hospitals to address all these populations while we teach through adoption. Um, but it's it's tricky because, you know, sometimes hospitals just want to go, I, I don't want anything to do with it. Put it in the drop box and we'll just give the baby to foster care and we don't have to, you know, it's almost like hot potato, right? <laughs> but that's not going to give best outcomes for mom and baby and, and potentially the family. So it's important to address that and hopefully have some accountability. Thanks. Um, we have a uh, comment that um, this particular person would love to see this in every hospital. Um, yes, please. Would like you to share you mentioned really briefly the two pieces of legislation, and she wants to hear a little bit about that. She'd like to read those and follow those. Yes. So we are getting close to having final language on two bills. One of them specifically addresses um, regulating adoption, making sure that we don't have unlicensed brokers or unlicensed professionals out there. Um, and really, when you think about what they, that would be targeting, it would be those that are basically selling access to expectant parents. So um, for example, I always think of it like college recruitment. Stay with me, that sounds weird, but again, stay with me. My husband would say the train will return to the station. Um, but if you think about it like that, we we just applied for college. We filled out our SSA, essays, we turned in our applications, but now, especially those that are that have money to do so, they hire people to represent them and try to get their kids into college or et cetera. And so if you think of adoption that way, there are a lot of people that are kind of out there match.coming saying, I will represent you. If you pay me this money, I will be out there looking for a pregnant mom that can choose you to be parents to her child. Now, there's no regulation. There's no licensing. There's no oversight. We don't even know if you're being shared an actual situation with a pregnant mom, but some of these unlicensed brokers, for lack of a better word, um, I mean, they're selling access to experiences to these circumstances. So I read an ad recently that said, well, if you want an email that there's a mom that matches what you're looking for, that's $35. But if you want a text message, that's $50. 
And when you're talking about close to a million families waiting and about 20,000 adoptions a year, the supply and demand, for lack of a better word, is having people spend a whole bunch of money. We even have some um, of these unlicensed, I, I keep doing this, I'm getting cramps in my fingers, professionals, right? We even have some of these unlicensed professionals that are selling access to the hospitals. And they'll say, well, if you want to pay extra every month, you can be considered for a stork drop baby. We have, we have hospitals we work for. And if a stork drop happens, which means a mom comes in, doesn't have a plan, calls and makes a decision last minute, you can pay extra to get in line for that baby. And that application even asks you, what are your liquid funds? What are your grants? And what um, what loans do you have? So they can really know how much money and it has to be liquid because it has to be wired to them immediately. So there's a lot of really scary, shady things that are happening and having that legislation specifically um, that addresses those unlicensed brokers is gonna be super important. The piece for our bill is about training in healthcare and making sure we have resources around parenting, adoption, and healthcare. And so those two haven't dropped yet. We're actually probably gonna see them drop in the new Congress, um, but I would absolutely encourage you visit our website, make sure that you sign up to get updates from us um, so that when we do have that current language, we'll be able to push it out. Because having support from places like Adoption Network are gonna be, it's gonna be really important, especially support from healthcare. Thank you for asking that question. Um, so let me just um, clarify or specify that those are federal uh -huh. bills um, uh -huh. and since we work yep. on state legislation so much. So yep. um, no, and I'm work. glad you said that, Betsy, because there's actually multiple states that are also starting to step forward and trying to um, craft legislation around those issues. A lot of um, them are looking at whether or not they allow advertising within their state and whether they allow these unregulated adoption professionals. So absolutely check in with us as well about that um, because at the state level, it's different in every state, but the internet blows up state lines. So it's definitely something that should be addressed both federally and at the state level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ohio was actually one of the states that didn't allow advertising historically until fairly recently. And that unfortunately, in my opinion, um, changed recently. And um, I know that the Ohio law has um, some language about adoption facilitators, but I think it probably could be stronger. Yeah. Well, and, and even if you find our first question is, does the state allow for facilitators? And the second question is, what if they're actually, if they don't allow it, are they actually enforcing it? Because we know multiple states, we know situations that are turned into the attorney general's office and then bounced over to ICPC because the baby crossed state lines and they say, nope, that's the attorney general's office. <laughs> and we just kind of bounce back and forth. So we know there are very few um, cases that are being held and these facilitators are getting more and more brazen in their, in their practices. They are, and they just put on their website, Oh, and by the way, we're not facilitators. I'm like, yeah, you kind of are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was so. just saying, what, what, you know, it's a part of it is the definition of what's a facilitator and what's not. So there, you know, where do you draw that line of what's okay? Right. And, and now you, you can throw in consultants. You have adoption agencies, adoption attorneys, consultants, oh. facilitators, broker. I mean, all of those. Um, and obviously, we don't think healthcare should be involved in any of that, as far as being involved in matching babies and families. Right. Um, to bring it back to Roe, because I'm sure that in the title caught a lot of people's eye and is a very hot topic. Um, yes. And, um, Rebecca, I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about people, of course, have been asking, um, mm -hmm. do, you know, will this increase the number of babies that are really pushed for adoption? Um, you know, what do we see happening or what do we think will happen? Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, I think it's definitely a question all of us are asking. I think there's a couple different points to it. I think we have states that have restricted abortion that already had high restrictions to abortion. So that's a little, how would those numbers change? The big change I am seeing is the amount of women that are coming in without a plan into hospitals. I talked to an agency a couple about a month ago that said that they're in six different states, and right now they're getting 50 to 60% of their placements are coming straight from the hospital, which means mom had no plan, and she walked into the hospital, 
ended up being referred to them, however that happened. Because again, remember, we don't have a referral system. So it could just be a, a, literally a file folder full of brochures or business cards that the case manager has just been collecting. Um, and then she's had no counseling. So if there is required counseling, there's kind of some frantic counseling going on. There's frantic matching with families. Maybe families are now flying in. And once you step onto that, it's really hard to step off of that once you've said you're looking at doing an adoption. And so I really get concerned with how fast women are going through the process, having their baby in those, those days right after birth, signing papers and going through that adoption without having the time to explore their resources, their parenting resources, what does ethical adoption even look like? So that's really concerning. I just saw data um, this weekend from the other side of the country, and they're at 48% of their calls are coming straight from the hospital. So I think I think that's where we're going to see the increase. I think people are not going to have a plan. They're going to come in and be like, I can't do this. I can't take this baby home. And if we don't have structure around that space, it's going to be ripe again for corruption. Um, but it also is going to be right for people making decisions that down the line, they wish they would have known what they know now, you know, that informed consent in healthcare, we just, where else do we kind of wing it? We should put the same structures in place in this area that we do so tightly in other areas of healthcare. So that's where my biggest worry is right now. We have two groups that really called me when the road decision came down. I heard from birth moms that were like, Rebecca, what are we going to do to protect moms that come in? Again, for fear of getting fast tracked on the adoption world, in the adoption world, or we also heard from those that um, are managing kids that are in foster care. And so we actually have a, a national webinar coming up in November, and it's sponsored by Dave Thomas for Adoption, because we ended up getting connected with them saying, okay, what are we going to do upstream to avoid the crisis of kids waiting in foster care downstream? And so we're able to make a plan and, and that webinar is November 15th, specifically to talk about how do you have conversations? What does a referral system need to look, look like? How do we meet moms earlier in their pregnancy to ensure that they have time to weigh their options between parenting and adoption? Because um, that was really the space we filled. We filled that space where they were going to carry to term, but they didn't know what to do. Well, they don't have to waste those months. They can spend that time getting prenatal care and making decisions about what they want to do long term, not just show up at the hospital without a plan. Yeah, the term stork drop um, was the first time I heard it. I had to really wrap my head around that. It's terrible. Um, I mean, it, it turns the woman into a bird. And yeah. I think that the most concerning, well, there's a lot of concerning things, but one of the most concerning things is I think that there are potential adoptive families out there that would love the idea of getting to walk in the door, pick up the baby and leave. No. And I don't want that to be the outcome that drives the decision for people to choose stork drops. So, you know, and I, I, don't, I don't know if you're, the bill that you're um, helping to craft covers this or not, but I've heard of situations, many situations, sadly, where hospitals have um, incentives to refer to certain agencies when they have these unexpected situations come up um, because there's a financial benefit to the hospital to choose agency A over some other agency. Um, no, I'm glad you brought that up. It, you know, and, and it's very it's very strategic because because I'm working in the healthcare space along with administrators, I know that when there is a specific agency that's called, well, maybe that agency tells the hospital, well, we'll do a cash pay for this delivery. Oh, so you yeah. won't have to turn it in to, you know, to go through Medicaid, Medi-Cal, whatever. We'll just go ahead and, and we'll cash pay for that. Well, price, well yeah. cash, cash pay. Not is, Medicaid, right. yeah. yeah, it's more than the, what they would get if they had to go through Medicaid. And so the idea of that, that kickback to the hospital now, when I've talked to administrators about that and to financial people, they're like, well, we don't know. It's just a cash pay. We never know why that's a cash pay. And that's why we have to have point people. When we talk about the patient advocate or the nurse navigator that's at the bedside that knows, okay, if there's an adoption going on, we need to know what this financial situation looks like, because that is a way that facilitators and adoption agencies are getting around flying women into different states to deliver within certain hospitals where they're more quote unquote adoption friendly 
because we can just cash pay and we don't have to apply for any of these supports from the state because they couldn't qualify because they haven't been there. And so there's a lot of things that are happening behind the curtain that could easily um, make this much easier for the corrupt for the corruption. Um, the other piece I think we have to keep in mind with the um, hospitals is making sure that 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 paid bill isn't used then to coerce that family. At Parker Adventist Hospital, we used to put a hold on all bills until she finalized and went ahead and signed her um, termination of parental rights. And, and that was specifically so that that paid bill wouldn't make her feel trapped into making that adoption plan. And because I was the adoption liaison, the agency could go ahead and contact me and say, hey, we went to court, you know, that can all drop. This can go, go through as, as, as planned. But I don't know of any other hospital in the country that does that for an adoption situation to ensure that money is not held over that patient's head as a, a piece of coercion to make sure she signs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit, again, circling back to Roe, um, just you know, a, a quick overview of the um, turnaway studies and how that, you know, I, I, that's one of the few studies I think that really looks at what could happen or what might happen. Um, so our uh, our audience this evening might be interested in some of that. Yeah. So the turnaway study, it's fascinating. If you have a chance, literally, you can Google it and it'll come up. Um, it basically found that when women were turned away for an abortion, ninety one percent chose to parent. And 9% chose adoption. But when you look at those percentages, this idea that if you're going to do, if you can't do abortion, you can just, oh, well, the other non-parenting option is adoption. So that must be equal on the table with parenting. And it's just not, it's not equivalent. Those of us that are in this space, it makes us crazy when we hear people say, well, it's okay. They can just do adoption. You should never say just about any of this. You know, it's definitely life-changing for everyone impacted. And so when you look at abortion rates prior to and adoption rates, we know that still just less than half of pregnancies are unplanned. Of those pregnancies, just less than half will abort and less than half will parent and then this was prior to the road change, obviously. And then when you're talking adoption, less than 1% choose adoption. And that's where that 20,000 a year comes in. It's, it's a very small percentage that choose infant adoption at this point too. There was actually a study by the Congressional Coalition and Adoption Institute that asked over a thousand people, where would you go for adoption information? Where would be the most trustworthy place to go? Well, the first place they said they'd go was the internet. But when they were asked where the most trustworthy place is, actually the least trustworthy came up as the internet. So they found out that people were going to a place they don't trust. When they asked them where the safest place or the most trustworthy place would be to get adoption information, 93% in the study said hospitals and healthcare, and there's nothing there. And I believe it's because we don't have skin in the game. We don't make money from the decision that's being made. So when you think about that turnaway study, I think also there's the fact that there's really also not a safe place right now to be able to go in and even look at what ethical adoption looks like without potentially being victimized by what's happening with brokers. So it's our goal is really, we know adoptions are gonna happen. So how do we keep that as a safe option and make sure people are empowered with education? Cause that, that turnaway study does not mean that if, if they didn't do abortion, that they just automatically went to the other non-parenting option, which is adoption, just didn't happen. Um, I don't. I don't know the answer to this. Did the, the um, turnaway studies talk at all about um, public system and how many of those families maybe later had? I know a lot of women parented under um, difficult circumstances. Yeah, um, you know, it did go on. I would encourage people to read it. It does go on to say if there if they were turned away from abortion, how many went into higher poverty rates higher, like you said, government support, there were, there are specific, I don't know off the top of my head, but there are specific impacts to that. And, and again, when you look at the restrictions, and I think so many people will say, if you have the money to get an abortion, you'll be able to get an abortion, you know, so we're really going to see such a specific population that's going to be impacted by this. And um, obviously it's concerning anytime that you are concerned with people that are going to be cornered and you know, 
in crisis and desperate. That's never a good combination, not knowing where to go for help. So we really wanna make sure that we can be there in that space. Thanks. Um, I've got a question that was private message to me about um, access to records for adult adoptees. And uh, she says, speaking of the hot potato, is there a conversation around remote <laughs> birth certificates and the ability for closed record states to enable children to keep and prevent sealed information, um, mm. you know, assuming that adoption is in their best interest and those children grow up, then having uh, information is also in their best interest. Absolutely. No, I agree 100%. And what was interesting being in, in the hospital space, there, there's a lot of um, outdated even information about what's in the medical record. So when, when I first started digging into the how do they put the electronic medical records in for the files, et cetera. And I remember at one point someone said, oh, we just have this whole adoption file that just keeps all that information in this folder. And I was like, why? And they're like, well, that's just what we've always done. <laughs> I was like, but why? She knows she had a baby. She knows she had a baby and there was an adoption. You're not, <laughs> it was so strange to think that they would separate that out. Um, the other thing is redacting information. That was something that that was done in the past that, I mean, when you look at the medical record, when you go to that, you don't want to go and get your medical record and find it's blacked out by Sharpies. So yes, hot tomato, hot potato for sure. But I think it absolutely needs to be dealt with at the level of electronic medical records, making sure that there's um, equal opportunity to access those records. I think right now we're dealing a lot with, oh, well, that's going to cost you hundreds and hundreds of dollars to get your records, even just to get your records of the birth that you you actually went through. It's like, I would like to get a copy of my records. Well, that's going to be this many dollars per page and blah, blah, blah. And I've got moms that are like, Rebecca, I can't afford that. I'm like, give me the phone number. <laughs> you know, because some of that is just, it's just inequality. It's just, it's not it's an equity, actually. It's it's not okay for people that have the ability to pay for those copies to get them. And I know that's probably a whole other separate piece to um, the extension of the sealed records, but it's definitely something I've seen. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, we're getting close on our time, so I've got a few um, closing comments. So, um, Rebecca, thank you so much for um, a lively discussion and for um, lots of good information. And Lori, thank you for putting so many good links in the Sorry. chat. Make sure that we send some of those out or hopefully all of them with um, the follow-up email that we send in a couple of days. Um, we do um, do a very short program evaluation. So if you um, would be uh, willing to give us feedback about this evening, that would be helpful. And here's the link yeah. for that. Um, and that will also be in the follow-up email that you receive if you don't do it this evening. Um, as many of you know, Adoption Network Cleveland is a nonprofit organization. We serve individuals and families impacted by adoption, kinship, and foster care uh, through support, education, and advocacy. And to find out more about our organization and to support our work, you can visit our website, which is adoptionnetwork.org. Um, we are a membership organization. And we hope that you will consider joining us as a member. So thank you for being here tonight. And um, we'll hope to see you in uh, November for our series of special mm -hmm. programs and lots of our other programs in between now and then. Thanks, everyone. Good night.